You are about to receive a phone call from an inmate at Fentanyl Correctional Center. Your conversation will be recorded and may be monitored. If you do not wish to receive this call, please hang up now. Hello, good morning. Good morning, bub. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. What have you been up to? Oh, not too much. Car theatre rings about 9.30 in the morning, most days. Just give a cleaning and all the laundry and all the stuff you do when you're in here. Bit same old, same old. I've known Kath since we were little at primary school together. But generally, are you feeling OK? Yes, you know, well, I've been in here long enough. <laughs> Kathy, in 2018, she has a way of analysing things now that maybe she wouldn't have had 15, 16 years ago. My life just seems like it's been never-ending battles and things that I've been having to take it over and conquer. Hunter Valley woman Kathleen Folbig has been found guilty of killing her four children. I think I just kept thinking to myself, no, 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 I have full faith in this justice system. She's not standing there screaming all the time, I've been wrongly done. That's not Kathy's way. She would rather sit there, go through due process, and let the world see that they made a really big mistake. If the objective truth is that Mrs. Folbig did not kill one or more of her children, then she is suffering unjustifiably. The problem is knowing what the objective truth is. And in this case, that is taken to be that she did kill them. I am not persuaded that the jury got it wrong. Kathleen Folbeek has been in jail now for 15 years for the murder of three of her children and manslaughter of, of one. The evidence against her was entirely circumstantial. I try to get out to see uh, Kathleen as, as often as I can, so I, I drive from Newcastle to Cessna. We'll go through what's happening with the, the legal process. In 2013, I gathered together the great legal minds in Newcastle and started researching and looking into it. I'm not an advocate for Kathleen Folbig. All I'm doing is pointing out that there is sufficient reason to have an inquiry. Australia's leading forensic pathologist has given an opinion. He is supported by other international experts. There are natural causes of death in this case. We submitted the petition in 2015, and it's been sitting in the Attorney General's office for two years. Hi, legal visit for Kathleen Folbig. It's incredibly frustrating but um, we all just wait. I have looked at the petition that Mrs. Folbig has lodged. I've looked at the reports that have accompanied that petition. I remain of the view that the jury was correct. There's no doubt Cathy had a difficult life long before she ended up in jail. At the age of three, she was placed in a foster family. All I wanted was a sister, and I got one. She was a glorious little girl. She was really lovely. She was the centre of attention. And then my son was born, and Kathy was just ignored. 
and it was a real shame because she was part of the family. Kathy came to school, it was the day after her 16th birthday. Just sat down and said, I'm not adopted. I'm, my parents are only foster parents and they've just told me all this yesterday. Kathy told me that her father had murdered her mother, which is how she ended up in the foster care system. Kathleen's father, Thomas Britton, was a Balmain dock worker. He liked to drink, and so did her mother, Kathleen Donovan. When her mother left in a, in a fight, he went after her, he begged her to come back. When she refused, eventually he stabbed her 24 times. Great birthday present to give someone to totally shatter their world and everything that they'd believed in for most of their life. She finished school after the trial HSC and she met Craig around that time. Well, I just sort of thought that's what I was on the planet for. You know, to me to sort of get married, have, have a child, do the family. Um, I guess because of, you know, being a foster kid in a state ward and, you know, all that sort of stuff, I, I just sort of thought FEMI was, was to be the ultimate important thing. Caleb was the, the firstborn. He was born on the 1st of February, 1989. Sadly, he only lived 19 days. Kathleen said she'd gone to check on him and she'd found him uh, limp and lifeless. Caleb's cause of death was determined at autopsy to be sudden infant death syndrome. A sudden death of an infant under one year of age which remains unexplained. Once she was pregnant with Patrick, she was apprehensive, but she was excited. The general consensus was that it only happens once. Patrick was born on the 3rd of June, 1990. When he was about four months old, Kathy said she found him to be not breathing Craig performed CPR. Kathleen called an ambulance and Patrick was revived on that occasion. Patrick developed severe brain damage stemming from that life-threatening event. And I think that ultimately led to a seizure disorder. Four months later, when Patrick was eight months old, Kath had put Patrick down for a sleep and she said she went in and found him not breathing. An ambulance was called but uh, he wasn't able to be resuscitated on that occasion. The pathologist determined that death in Patrick's case was due to airways obstruction, which was in turn due to epileptic fits, which was in turn due to an encephalopathic disorder or disease of the brain. We were both pregnant at the same time. So we then hung out together when Sarah was little. Sarah was the cheekiest one ever. Run around sticking her tongue out at you. She just thought that, that was going to get a laugh. Kathy was very attentive. I never looked after Sarah. I didn't have any CPR training and I didn't take any offence that she wouldn't leave Sarah with me. In August 1993, when uh, Sarah was 10 months old, Kathy said she got up to, to check on Sarah and found her to be lifeless. An ambulance was called and she was unable to be resuscitated. Sarah's death was determined to be a sudden infant death syndrome case. You're such a busy baby. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, you tell only all about it. 
When Laura came along, we were just absolutely thrilled, the whole of my family. Knock on the door. But we were really scared that something was going to happen to Laura. Okay. Hello, Annie Lee. Hello, Annie Laura was special. She was more of a person. She wasn't just a baby. And she was adored by everyone. She was a beautiful little kid. Oh, you just love doing that, don't you? Do you think you're funny? <laughs> when she had her first birthday, boy, could we go to town, because this is the first time one of the kids had actually made a first birthday. She was, you know, around the longest, and when she got to 12 months, we, we actually thought we were home and hose. On the 1st of March, 1999, Laura was about 19 months old. Craig had gone to work. Kathy went to the gym and she took Laura with her, and then Laura fell asleep in the car on the way home. Kathy said she'd transferred her inside, left her asleep, and then checked on her about 15, 20 minutes later and, and found her to be not breathing. Ambulance emergency. I need an ambulance. Um, my baby's not breathing. Okay, and how old's your baby? 20 months old. Can you just hold a minute? I'm trying to do CPR. 20 months old. I'm getting any heartbeat or anything. Okay. Do you know why this is? I've had three sisters already. Pardon? I've had three go already. And your name? It's Kathy. Kathy. When Laura died, I just didn't feel anything anymore. I didn't care. I didn't feel anything because I was left behind. And, and I'm not going to be this mother. I'm not going to have this family. And I thought it's going to get denied. I immediately just blamed myself when, oh my God, I got complacent. Laura suffered from a cold-like illness during the week prior to death. She ultimately was found to have myocarditis at autopsy, and that's typically caused by a viral infection. Myocarditis means inflammation of the heart muscle. Dr. Carla, the autopsy pathologist who conducted the autopsy on Laura, determined that the cause of death was, in fact, undetermined. When Laura died, she was aged about 18 to 20 months. Then that's just far too old uh, for that death to be called sudden infant death syndrome. Alan Carla did a thorough examination of Laura's little body. And this is the fourth child in his family. And he said, well, well, I can't say to you 100% that Laura wasn't suffocated. The common view from the DPP and from other groups was, yeah, look suspicious, yeah, we think she did it, but basically, you'll never prove it. Probably because of the circumstantial nature of the case. There'd been no smoking gun, as, as it were. In the 90s and the early part of this century, there was a general sentiment that one death in a family is a tragedy, two deaths in the same family is suspicious, and three infant deaths in the same family should be considered as homicide until proven otherwise. The big turning point in the case was when we received a phone call from Craig. He wanted to have a talk about things. Craig had told us that Kathleen continually became stressed with the children. And then finally, he said, my wife keeps a diary. And there's suspicious entries in that. November 19, January 1, 1997. October 1997. I know there's nothing wrong with her. Nothing out of the ordinary anyway. Because it was me, not them. Wouldn't have handled another like Sarah. She saved her life by being different. That stress made me do terrible things. Got so bad, I nearly purposely dropped her on the floor and left. What scares me most will be when I'm alone with the baby. With Sarah, all I wanted was her to shut up. And one day she did. From that moment, it was a murder investigation. From that moment, I read the diary. Do you know what sort of person would kill four children? I have no comprehension. And I don't even want to think about it. Kathy, did you kill Caleb? No! 
Did you kill Patrick? No. Did you try to kill Patrick on that New Miss episode? <laughs> no. Did, did you kill Sarah? No. And did you kill Laura? No. It wasn't until he was asking those questions that I sort of finally semi clicked what was going on. It, it was just so shocking to me. And it was a dawning and realisation that people have been saying things and people are alleging things, you know. As Director of Public Prosecutions, I was ultimately responsible for all the prosecution of serious offences in New South Wales. Ultimately, uh, I decided that there was a reasonable prospect of conviction. Kathleen Megan Folbig has pleaded not guilty to murdering the children. In the build-up to the Folbig trial, there was obviously an enormous amount of media attention. This was a woman accused of killing her four children, and if found guilty, she would be Australia's worst female serial killer. I went to the trial. It was seven and a half weeks of emotionally wrenching evidence. The Crown says the accused smothered each of her children to death. She either deliberately killed them or wanted to render them unconscious to, in effect, put them to sleep. The Crown's theory was that Kathleen Folbig killed each child in a moment of uncontrolled anger and then immediately raised the alarm in perhaps remorse at what she had done. One of the most compelling aspects of the prosecution was that Craig, the father of these children, actually gave evidence against Kathleen. Craig said, Kathy was very, very stressed around the children, particularly around the time of Sarah and Laura's deaths. And he described this deep, guttural growl that would come from Kathy and how um, Laura, in particular, would collapse on the floor. The Supreme Court heard today how a woman accused of smothering her four children kept a diary detailing her dark moods. The diary entries were a very powerful voice in the case and in the courtroom. Kathleen did not give evidence herself, so she allowed the diaries to be her voice. She's a fairly good-natured baby, thank goodness. It has saved her from the fate of her siblings. I think she was warned. I feel like the worst mother on this earth. Scared that she'll leave me now like Sarah did. I knew I was short-tempered and cruel sometimes to her. But she left with a bit of help. The diary entries were open to the interpretation that these were the private confessions of a guilty person. Why else would she write that her child had left with a bit of help? And that quote was, that was a reference to God or to some higher being or a higher power or something going on that I didn't understand. I was thinking about why was I not allowed to have the other three, but now I've fallen pregnant again, am I, allowed to gain, am I going to be allowed to keep this one? The prosecution case was very strong. There was the husband, the diaries, the police witnesses, the medical experts. Dr Carla's evidence was perhaps the most important medical evidence at trial. Um, Dr Carla had conducted the autopsy on Laura. He had found myocarditis inflammation in Laura's heart. It was Dr Carla's opinion that the extent of the myocarditis in Laura's heart was not that advanced, that there was not severe enough disease to be readily associated with a cause of sudden death. Dr. Carla's opinion that myocarditis was unlikely to have been the cause of Laura's death was supported by other medical experts in the trial. Uh, Dr. Carla and others considered that rather than the expression SIDS, a better description of the causes of death would have been undetermined. Well, certainly in my view, reading the expert reports that were available at trial a jury could well be satisfied that there was no natural 
cause of death for each of the four children. There was never one single piece of evidence that said, yes, Kathleen Fulbick did it. But over the course of a seven and a half week trial, the weight of evidence built up a compelling picture. The prosecutor underlined in the case the fact that Kathleen had found the first three children dead, had not picked them up and had not attempted CPR. The defence countered by saying that she was a loving mother and there was a lack of physical evidence that those children had actually been smothered. To the case of Kathleen Folbig, found guilty of killing her four infant children. Justice Graham Barr found that Kathleen Folbig had displayed a distinct lack of grief. He says she's unlikely to ever admit her guilt to anyone but herself. Kathleen stood there and as the verdict was delivered, she buckled and cried and it was absolutely awful to watch. I was very upset but pleased that they found her guilty. That would have been an absolute shock, because the whole time, Cathy did not want to go to jail, and I'm, I'm afraid that's where she is, and she's going to be there for a long time. When the verdict was read out, how did you feel? Absolutely shattered. I might have had every wall up trying to protect me, but there's nothing that can protect you from that. It's just like they've got this big, giant sledgehammer and just gone smash. There's been an exhaustive process. The case has been assessed by a magistrate, by a jury of 12, which was unanimous in convicting, by the Court of Criminal Appeal, and the High Court has seen nothing to be concerned about in the way in which the convictions have been recorded. In 2003, I was actually studying Lindy Chamberlain's case. Folbig's case was being reported in the Australian media. So I was thinking very much about the murder trials of, of mothers. When I reviewed the case, I started from the position that the evidence had been strong. But I now believe much of the evidence that had been introduced at trial was unreliable. I think that the most striking evidence that the jury heard was from medical witnesses, each of whom was asked by the prosecution whether the medical literature documented three or more sudden unexplained deaths in a family being natural deaths. Every medical witness uh, answered no to that question. I think the jury would have found that that really compelled a conclusion that the children were killed. In fact, the medical literature documented cases of natural, unexplained deaths in families, three or more such deaths. And since the time of the trial, more cases have been documented. Emma Cunliffe was the first uh, expert and, and academic to s seriously question the convictions against Kathleen Folbig. In 2013, we came onto the scene and started our legal investigation into the case. I had started the process of, of writing to experts and the response was extraordinary. They have written reports for us and have not been paid a cent. Professor Hill examined the statistics around infant mortality uh, in families. It's important to note that while multiple cot deaths may be a rare event, so also will be multiple homicide. When two or three cot deaths or sudden infant deaths have occurred, the statistics show that there is no more reason to suppose that these are murder than cot deaths. Dr Sharmila Betts wrote a report about examining the diaries and the significance of the, the diary entries. Sharmila Betts is a clinical psychologist in Sydney. Her conclusion is that 
Kathleen Folbig had a very rigid and exacting, highly idealised conception of what good motherhood looked like and that she was constantly failing to meet her own expectations of her mothering. My guilt of how responsible I feel for them all haunts me. Like many, I was shocked by what I read in the diaries um, and I did feel that there was good reason to be concerned about uh, whether Kathleen Folbig had killed her children. What sort of mother have I been? A terrible one. That's what it boils down to. Those diaries are written from a point of me always blaming myself. I blame myself for everything. I took so much of the responsibility because that's, as mothers, what you do. I read the diaries now as Kathleen Folbig blaming herself for getting frustrated and feeling as if, if she had only been a better mother, perhaps the children would not have died. But that's very different from admitting that she killed the children. It's a 125 page report that you've written for us. So... When we submitted the petition in 2015, by far the most compelling fresh evidence we had was Professor Cordner's report. Is it fair to say that that's probably the most significant report that you've had to produce? It's certainly the longest report I've written. He wrote a report examining the forensic evidence that had been presented at the trial. Yeah, I have put quite a bit of effort into it. Yeah. Professor Stephen Cordner is the former director of the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine. He has a worldwide reputation as a forensic pathologist. And I think everybody in my position has this rule that you don't talk about the content of reports until all legal proceedings are finished. Professor Cordner's report may be used in subsequent legal proceedings and hence he felt it would not be appropriate and proper for him to personally give evidence in relation to this matter at this time. In respect of Caleb, Professor Cordner reaches the conclusion that his death was properly categorised as a SIDS death. In respect of Patrick, Professor Cordner concludes that his death, though unexpected in a narrow sense, could be explained by the epilepsy disorder that he experienced in the last several months of his life. In respect of Sarah, Professor Cordner concludes that her death is properly ascribed to SIDS. And in respect of Laura, Professor Cordner says that he would have given the cause of death as myocarditis or inflammation of the heart muscles. I've been asked by ABC to provide an opinion on the report prepared by Professor Stephen Cordner from Melbourne. Fundamentally, I'm in agreement with Professor Cordner in that all four of these child deaths could be explained by natural causes. We have here the sections of Laura's heart. This is a times 200 magnification image. And this is the inflammation of the heart muscle that makes this disease myocarditis. And if you look now at lower power, you can see this disease is actually present quite extensively across this heart muscle. It's not the most florid example I've ever seen, but it's certainly most definitely there. And as I say, it's present on each and every section I've looked at. What's the significance of seeing inflammation on every slide? Well, I think it comes down to judgment as to whether or not this disease could be ascribed as the cause of death. And I think the more extensive the disease is, the more likely it is this will explain death. I think this is an eminently fatal case of myocarditis. Of course, we can't say for sure that this would have been the cause of death in Laura's case. All I can say is I think this provides a very good explanation for her untimely death. I think we have to concede it's a possibility that these children were smothered, that the deaths were unnatural, but there's no positive evidence to indicate that would have been the case. If one were to attempt to smother a healthy, robust, normal 18-month-old child, you would expect, I think, reasonably, that this infant would put up a struggle. This struggling would be expected to, I think, give rise to some injuries. In Laura's case, there weren't any such signs whatsoever. 
And of course, I'm not privy to all the other evidence that was heard by the court during the trial. But on the basis of the medical evidence alone, I think this case certainly needs to be re-examined quite carefully. The scientists look at this from a scientific point of view. They are looking for physical evidence. They find physical evidence of myocarditis. They don't find physical evidence of smothering. That doesn't mean that smothering didn't happen. And it doesn't necessarily mean, I would suggest, that the myocarditis alone was the cause of death. Essentially, the logic of the prosecution case falls apart once there is a diagnosable cause of death in respect of one of the children. Take Laura's death out of the sequence of deaths wouldn't necessarily mean that all of the convictions should be set aside. It may mean that the conviction in relation to Laura should be set aside, but it doesn't necessarily follow that the other three should be. You can't just simply say, well, we, we got one wrong, uh, but the others can still stand. It doesn't work that way. In the years that have followed, much has been made about the medical evidence. But sitting through the trial, the medical evidence wasn't the most compelling part of the case. It was Craig's evidence, the diaries, and the way it all built up to this compelling picture. I feel that the expert reports that have been gathered by the team working on the review application are very strong, fresh evidence that these convictions are unreliable. The decision we took was to present a petition directly to the governor. There is no logical reason for not having an inquiry. We submitted the petition to the governor in 2015. There's got to be a report at, at some point. I mean, Essentially, what we're asking is somebody needs to have a look at this case again. There is a requirement now that justice be done and inquiry be held. What's exceptional is the delay from the time of the submission of the review, and we still haven't heard uh, from relevant people in government about whether or not there is going to be an inquiry. The fact that the petition was filed three years ago is concerning. I think this is an inordinate delay in dealing with the matter. But having looked at that material, I think that another jury, even taking into account the material that has now been produced, could and would still be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt of her guilt. Who's got you, Mummy's got you? Has she? You being the cutie? Four children just did not die by themselves. They died by the hand of their mother. And she was supposed to be there to protect them and love them and look after them, and she didn't. If the conviction is quashed and she is released, I will take it as a huge miscarriage of justice because I'm of the opinion that, yes, she did it. If Kathleen Folbig is innocent, she has lost four children. The idea of losing a child is horrifying for any parent. The idea of losing four is unimaginable. The idea of losing four children and then being wrongly accused of having killed those children is simply unbearable. We've been waiting, it seems like an endless age for this petition. Yes, I, 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 I do feel incredibly frustrated. And I think it's just because we're just simply waiting for a decision. That's three years now. We've been clinging to that little bit of hope. If, if you know, I can get myself heard in any way, then I guess my, my life, 15 years in prison, will be worth it.